We want to welcome you back to the STAND Conference. We have a session now with questions and answers about moral relativism, talking about topics applicable to young people and all people today, how we as believers can take a stand. Hope you enjoyed a good lunch. How many of you had a Chick-fil-A sandwich? Yes. One of the great benefits of being a student at Bob Jones University is you have a Chick-fil-A on the very presence of campus. And we actually give our students what's called Bruins Bucks, so they can go and spend their Bruins Bucks at Chick-fil-A, and it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So glad you all enjoyed your Chick-fil-A for lunch and are back here for this afternoon session. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gary Weir after we sing an opening song. Uh, we're going to sing another song, and then after that, Dr. Weir will come to facilitate our session this afternoon. Dr. Weir is our Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost, um, and he is engaged with their student body regularly in helping us as a student body, faculty, and staff understand the importance of biblical worldview, of apologetics, of the importance of believers learning and growing in their faith. So we're excited for he, him being here this afternoon, the opportunity to lead this session. So we'll go ahead and ask Jalen to come and lead in a song this afternoon, and then Dr. Weir will come. God created us for his glory and by his grace. Let's remember this truth as we sing a verse of to the praise of his glorious grace. this afternoon and appreciate your being here on our campus today and I know I really benefited from our sessions uh, this morning and we're so glad that Dr. Ham and Dr. Pettit are here with us this afternoon. Uh, these are two men who the Lord has used in, in uh, various ways and powerful ways and it's based upon a daily walk uh, that they have with the Lord and the Lord has given them many different experiences that we can learn from and that we can glean from. So it's my privilege to I put before them uh, several different questions so that we can hear from them and learn more about what it takes and what is, it, what is involved in standing in the current culture in which we live. So we'll begin with this question. Uh, how is a humanistic worldview affecting you most often in your different ministries uh, today? Maybe, Dr. Ham, we could begin with you on this question. But um, that's an interesting question. We are being impacted in many different ways, and I've uh, just been uh, thinking about this. Um, for instance, one of the ways that we never thought we would be impacted is getting deplatformed, and we're being deplatformed in all sorts of ways. Uh, for instance, one of the big groups that publishes jobs uh, that when you have a, a, a job that's available and to publish on their site is Indeed, and they're out of Texas. Well, they uh, told us we could no longer publish our jobs on Indeed because we require people to sign our statement of faith, which also says marriage is a man and a woman, so the whole uh, LGBT thing comes into this. And it was interesting because I went on their site and had a look, and they have uh, different groups there, publishing positions they want to be filled, for instance, Muslims, and they even have a requirement you have to believe the Quran and study the Quran. And, uh, there's all sorts of other groups on Planned Parenthood. 
must agree with their worldview in, in regard to abortion, but we're Christian and we're not allowed to be on there. Uh, we also had um, uh, an instance recently where even uh, coming from uh, Microsoft, that certain that we're not allowed to have our educational discount we used to have because they disagree with our stand, because we are uh, not agreeing with LGBT, and so we're not allowed to get those educational discounts, which is, you know, that, that can be tens of thousands of dollars. And people don't understand why I haven't been banned from Facebook or Twitter yet. I don't understand that either. I've tried. Uh, but apparently, so far, actually what I try to do is every post I make, I put a Bible verse on there, and I don't attack people personally. And I try to keep away from certain topics, but, um, but it's interesting that we also, um, I even the company that did our payroll told us they don't want to work with us anymore. And so we've had to change, a company, we're in the middle of changing that over right now. And that's all in regard to the same things. In fact, we have a team at Answers in Genesis right now who they've been working for months looking at what if we get thrown off this platform? What if this platform? We have our own streaming platform, Answers.tv. What if we get thrown off that? And we're, we're actually doing all sorts of backup uh, uh, research uh, to, to have things ready in place, and we're changing some things over to other systems, uh, to other companies, and there's other Christian organizations we're working with behind the scenes. There's a lot going on there, but that is a big issue for the whole ministry. Um, we're not, it, it, it's just something that we've been really dealing with lately. And so that's going to be an issue because the world doesn't want our message getting out there. They want to stop us from doing that. Another, another one is in regard to credit cards and, and companies that take your credit card payment. There's an issue there as well. And so we've had to work through that. So uh, there's been all sorts of issues there. Also, uh, when we built the ARC, we found out that in the state of Kentucky, they have a tourism tax incentive. It's a sales tax incentive. Basically, if you can think about it this way, if you're going to bring a new tourist facility to Kentucky, they say to entice you to build it in Kentucky, because we were looking at either Ohio, Indiana, or Kentucky for the Ark, because the Creation Museum is just across the river from Indiana and Ohio. So we're right in that tri-state area. And so Kentucky state government passed legislation, if you build a tourist facility in Kentucky, what they'll do is this. Uh, if you're approved for this ahead of time, and if you really do bring an increase in tourism, and uh, you're building that in Kentucky, then the sales tax you charge within the facility itself, so th this is only the sales tax within the ARC, charged on tickets or what you sell at the ARC, you will get a rebate on that. In other words, it's money you generate, but you'll get a rebate on it for up to 10 years, depending on how much money you invested in uh, building the facility. And you know, Newport Aquarium and the Speedway and lots of other places had this. So we applied for it and were approved for it, but then the governor of Kentucky wrote us a letter and said, he is stopping us from getting that because, he actually put in the letter, because you are Christian, you, you tell people about Jesus. Ken Ham even said this, and then quoted me telling people about Jesus. Well, I did say that. But he quoted me as, you know, can you imagine Ken Ham telling people about Jesus? I mean, how terrible. <laughs> um, and then he also said, and because you only employ people who agree with your statement of faith, and therefore you can't because you discriminate against people who don't, don't agree with you. So that was one of those times when we believed that we had to stand up for what was right. And so we went to court to a federal judge, uh, and a federal judge ruled totally in our favor. And it was like a 70-page ruling in which he said, this is a facially neutral incentive. In other words, it's offered to anyone who builds a tourist facility. You can't stop them from doing it just because they're Christian. That's discrimination. And then, on the basis of the 1964 Civil Rights Act Title VII exemption, we are allowed to have a religious exemption for our hiring. And so, 
we can hire people in accord with our statement of faith, and that's what we do. Um, so we, uh, we won that case, and then the governor was voted out, and the new governor came in who was a Christian, who then didn't appeal it, so that ruling set as a precedent, which is really, really good. But we didn't think we'd have to battle these sorts of things because we're telling people about Jesus or that we're likely to get deplatformed and thrown off uh, all sorts of places and not allowed to buy certain software and use certain companies because of who we are. But uh, they're some of the battles we, we are having to deal with right now. Hmm. I wrote down a couple of things, and I, I appreciate what Dr. Ham said. So in some ways, uh, being an educational institution is going to be a little different than their ministry. Um, the uh, Bob Jones University is one of, of, uh, of a number of universities who have uh, written the Department of Civil Rights and actually obtained uh, religious exemption so that we could, we can, we, we can, we can have um, regulations here that we, for example, you can't work here and be LGBTQ uh, or or be a student here at Bob Jones University, so uh, allows us to maintain our moral standards. That's where we are now. Uh, the, uh, if the Equality Act is passed, that will change everything. And it won't just change it for schools that take federal funds, it'll, change, it'll, it'll affect all schools, regardless of whether you get money from the government or not. So in some ways, we're a little bit sheltered from that. Um, but that, that never, you know, in, as he mentioned, some places that would not do business with you. We don't have that so much in South Carolina. We give thanks to God every day that we actually live in the state of South Carolina. And we have a wonderful governor and who's very supportive. Uh, and so uh, because of that, we, we have a lot more freedoms here than if, for example, we were living in California or New York. So it'd be a two different, completely different worlds. Um, we do face persecution from the sense of companies that uh, we, we were doing one of our uh, artist series last year, our Living Gallery, and we actually contacted Sony Music uh, to pay royalty fees to use a couple of particular songs, and they were like classical songs, and they wrote us back and denied us uh, the right to do that simply because of our faith and our particular stands that we take as a university. So we expect that to happen, and I think all Christians should expect that to happen. So uh, it's, going, it's hard for us to know uh, because of the nature of a university. We have a lot of relationships with a lot of different organizations, whether it's accreditation organizations or the NCAA, which is in the, actually in the NCAA sports, is actually they're, they're going through a, um, a pretty radical change right now in their processes. So we're not really sure where everything's going to land down on that. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I would say those are looking outside, looking inside, looking at our own student body. I would say the greatest challenge we face is our own students coming who maybe have grown up in a Christian home, maybe even gone to Christian school, homeschool, however they were educated. And, and yet they've been so influenced by the world, they're not really sure where they are. They don't know where they really stand on LGBTQ issues. And that's a really, really big deal today because we're like all schools, we'll have people graduate and four or five years after graduation, they've actually taken a pretty dramatic shift in a different direction. It's not because they weren't taught truth or raised in truth, it's because of the effects of the culture. And so we work really, really hard with our students, number one to educate them with a complete biblical worldview. How do you look at the world and all that you're doing? Number one, number two, we, we are very strong in our emphasis on local church because in the end, you have, to be, you have to be connected to the local church. And if you're outside the domain of the local church, according to Paul, you're actually in the domain of Satan. And so you really need to be a part of a local church where you find protection within that body of believers. And so uh, we're, li we're educating 18 to 23 year olds who are making s many of them the biggest decisions of their life about their future family, faith, friendships, morals, biblical worldview. So I would say our concentration is more here in the lives of our students. So, so building off that question uh, just a little bit, maybe we can reflect specifically about the last five years. And for our students out here, the last five years is a relatively smaller percentage 
of their lives than, than you all, but I won't comment on our ages up here. But for them, it's, you know, it's a big portion of their lives, and of course, COVID has been a big part of that. So how would you characterize what's happened in the last five years that is really, from your vantage points, unprecedented or really unexpected um, in your lifetime? I don't know who wants to begin with that Go one. Go ahead, sir. Well, I first uh, came over to America in 1980, so I grew up in what I call a very pagan culture uh, in Australia, and probably less than 1% are born-again Christians. And so I grew up in a very secular world, not many churches. Uh, my father was a teacher, and when he was transferred around, when he was promoted, sometimes there were no, t no churches, sometimes one. Um, and in Australia, you know, being a very secular nation, I, I, I just wasn't, I'd never heard of Christian universities, Christian colleges, never heard of such things. When I came over to America for the first time in 1980, I was absolutely stunned because there were Christian radio stations everywhere, uh, nativity scenes at Christmas time, and people singing Christmas carols and playing Christmas carols in, in shopping centers and church, uh, church buildings that I could see everywhere. And, you know, I toured around. In fact, I came and visited Bob Jones University. And I was just amazed at a number of churches. And I, to me, this was, wow, this is so Christian over here. I remember going back and talking to my wife and others back in uh, Australia. You wouldn't, be wouldn't believe the freedom for Christianity in America and how Christian it, the culture seems to be. Well, this is 2021. And I tell you, compared to when I first came to America, this is a different culture. It's a totally different culture. I mean, who would have ever expected that you'd have you know, public school saying that uh, males can go into female restrooms and so on. Who, who would have expected that the LGBT movement that, it, that is a small percentage of the population is driving the entire culture in, in every area? I mean, there's something very, uh, very sinister about it all. I, it's, a, it's obviously a very spiritual issue. Um, and, and then to see crosses, nativity scenes being removed because you have groups like the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which are really, the best way to describe them is a group of atheist bullies out of Wisconsin who come in and bully counties and schools that if you don't get rid of the Bible, you don't get rid of these crosses and so on, then we're taking you to court and people just say, okay, we'll get rid of them. Uh, and and un unfortunately, they've been very successful in removing Christian symbols and, and uh, the Bible from various places. And who would have, who would have thought that uh, the abortion issue would be such a volatile issue and become so emotional and even seeing people chanting how they want to kill babies. I mean, they've actually been chanting that sort of thing. So it has changed dramatically. I mean, uh, I, I stand back and I, I think of the contrast. Of course, in 1980, probably half of these weren't even born, but probably most of them weren't born. Yeah, most of them, yeah, most them weren't born. Actually, okay. before 2000, so. <laughs> Yeah. How many yeah. of you were born in the 2000s? Yeah, everybody. All right. <laughs> Except for... See, you, di you didn't see the America I saw uh, back then. Well, does that mean I'm getting old? I don't know. Yes, sir. <laughs> I had to dye my hair gray to Soon show people you will people catch I was up with old. Noah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I can see the contrast. And, you know, you people probably just, you know, as, as you grow and mature, you, you're growing up in a culture where things are tolerated today and things happening that it never was like that. So there's been a dramatic change. I've certainly seen that. Uh, I, I've written down a couple of things, but one thing I want to kind of go back to, when, when Bob Jones University was founded in 1927, uh, the founder, Bob Jones Sr., started the school because he was concerned about the negative influence of the secular and liberal education in the United States of America in the 1920s. And what he saw was he saw, he saw the world as he knew it was changing. So it's not like this is new to American history. And so we see things changing fairly, fairly rapidly. Uh, I would say a number of things that have kind of come to the surface, number one, 
is just the way people are very polarized today. Um, we live, because, and particularly I think COVID is, I think, <clears throat> I think COVID has accelerated a lot of things. Uh, the polarization is that people have lived isolated with a lot of information, so they become very individualistic. And so therefore they're very quick with opinions in, and with that quickness of opinion comes actually emotional responses and, and divisions and so forth. And I'm not talking about in the world, I'm actually talking among God's people. So there has definitely become a polarization of, of attitudes and it's not really centered on biblical doctrine or biblical truth as far as the church is concerned. It's really on social and cultural issues. And that's very, that's very challenging. Um, another thing is that uh, things that I didn't expect to see uh, along with the polarization uh, was, was particularly in our culture the, the radical um, uh, response in the last year and a half uh, to the critical race theory, which is rooted in critical theory, and, and race is, is basically the focal point of it, which is rooted in the roots of Marxism and socialism that basically says you have two groups of people. You have the oppressors and the oppressed, uh, proletariat and bourgeoisie, which goes back to the start of communism, in what, which is the foundation of communist Russia. And today, basically, it's, it's the same idea, but now it's rooted in race or, or people of color. And, and the critical race theory is basically, a, it's a narrative of the United States of America that has never been the narrative of the United States of America. And it doesn't mean there's not racism in the United States of America. Everybody here would acknowledge that and has been throughout history and a lot of bad decisions have been made. All of those things are true, but that's very different from the critical race theory, which really the only really, the only really answer to the critical race theory is the overthrow of the United States of America into something that we don't even know what would be other than history has already told us, and that when you have socialism and communism, that's what you're going to get. So that's really where we are, and this is where young people really need to be aware of this, and this is very, very important. But I want to, I want to flip that and say one other thing. And that is what, I'm, what I've been actually surprised by in the last few years is, on, is in, in spite of all of this, I've been extremely encouraged by the um, passionate desire of Christian young people today who do believe the Bible and they do believe that God is in control and they actually have an incredible hope and the Lord and what he's going to do in our world because God has put your generation in a particular position. You know, sometimes when you get older, it's, it's easy to become negative because most of your life is behind you and you remember the good old days and that's not today. And when I look at, I look at Christian young people because I live my whole life with 20-somethings, I'm, I'm looking at a group of young people that are in, in, incredibly intelligent, very passionate, love Jesus Christ, they want to serve him, and in many ways, I think they're willing to accept whatever comes in their lot in life, and they don't want to live their lives in fear. They want to live their life in faith and let God do great things because almost all the miracles in the Bible came at, at tension points. At t they didn't come when everything was easy. You don't get somebody to still the storm until there's a storm. And you don't cross the Red Sea and split the Red Sea unless you have the army of Pharaoh behind you. And you don't get to see manna come down from heaven unless you're in the desert. And if God doesn't provide, you're going to starve. So in the midst of all of the tensions and the pressures and the persecutions, that's where you see the greatest acts of God done. And I just want to say that to you as young people because I really believe that in some ways it may be that this is the great generation. This is the generation where people have prayed for years that God would send a revival and God had to send all this stuff to get us to a place of greater dependence to see God at work. So... In one way, I'm super pumped and excited uh, in the midst of the fact that we actually are living in a day of great challenges. And so here on campus, in some ways, yeah, we live in a bubble, but it's a pretty happy bubble. And so we're happy to be here. That's good. Um, if I can add something to this, something I was, I was thinking of, J just to help us understand what has really happened and the way I've understood it, you know, as an Australian sort of looking in at America, even though we've lived here since 1987. 
But um, you weren't even born in 1927, were you? When they started Bob Jones? No. Okay. Uh, so, 28 years later. Um, you know, when you think of the, the Bible talking about the broad way and the narrow way, one of the things that has hit me over the years is to understand the world we live in is the broad way. We are living in the broad way, but the narrow way is within the broad way and going in a whole different direction. And you think of all those forces out there in the broad way that can so easily drag us in the wrong direction. And as I've sort of looked, looked in at, at America as, uh, as a Christian and, and someone from a different country, what it seems to me is w when you look at those generations, like the greatest generation, those born before 1928, and then you have the silent generation, and then you have the baby boomers generation, I would say they're the more Christianized generation. And what I mean by that is if you think of the Judeo-Christian ethic that came out of the founding fathers, not all of them were Christian, but some of them were Christian. But nonetheless, they had a respect for the Bible, that Judeo-Christian ethic sort of permeated the culture and permeated the public schools as well. And so even non-Christians would say marriage was a man and a woman because they adopted that Christian ethic. So they would say that abortion was wrong, by and large, uh, and also two genders, you know, male and female. And you think about it, in the public school for those older generations, there was that veneer of Christianity. I'd, I'd say the veneer of Christianity has been there in this culture. Now, the battle, that's why I said in the first session, the battle started 6,000 years ago. The battle hasn't changed. The battle was always there. And what has happened is when you look at Generation X, Generation Y, Generation Z, and then we've got Generation Alpha coming up after them, but when you think, think about it from a perspective of, you know, the public schools used to allow prayer on assembly or before football or graduation. You could even have the Bible in school. You could teach creation even in the classroom. Uh, they would have nativity scenes at Christmas. You sing Christmas carols. But that's basically all gone. And what's happened is that veneer of Christianity has been taken out of the schools and taken out of the culture. And now you're seeing the real world because... It, it actually is the real world. This is the real world that we're seeing in all of its naked ferocity, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and we're seeing it before our very eyes. What happens when you take away that veneer of Christianity? And now, generations X, Y, Z are very secularized, uh, very evolutionized, very, very much like a pagan Greek culture, in a way. And th when you understand that, too, it means you have to understand there's different ways to approach them. They think differently. They have a different foundation for their thinking. You can't just uh, approach them in the same way you approach the older generations. And just like someone said to me the other day, they said, oh, you know, uh, for the older generations, we basically just preached the gospel and that's all that was really needed. We didn't have to, didn't have to deal with, uh, with the issues of Genesis and so on. But my response was, but I think that's a problem in that the older generations should have shown that we always need that foundation because if you assume the foundation is there and you don't make sure you deliberately give that foundation to the coming generation, then it can be lost, which is what I think has happened. So that, that sort of in a nutshell to me is what's happened. The veneer of Christianity has been ripped off. Now we're seeing the real world and we're realizing, wow, this is a world where men love darkness rather than light. Key ways we're seeing Romans 1 played Romans out. One. God's wrath is just letting people go their own direction and then, and then face those consequences. Uh, something you said, uh, Dr. Pettit, with this next question sort of leads into that. We, we know that God is at work no matter what we see around us. And when God's people, uh, young people, uh, people of all generations are responding, we also know that, um, that Satan wants to have his way as well. Uh, we're warned throughout Scripture that as God's people, we're not to be deceived, which of course lets us know that there is the strong potential that we will be deceived if we're not careful. And going to Genesis 3, we see the consequence of, of Adam and Eve being deceived by Satan. So from, from your experience and as you um, look at the culture around us, what are some specific ways that you're seeing today that God's people are in real ways and in potential ways being deceived by Satan? 
Um, uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. I'm trying to think of the simplest way to answer it. Um, I, I would like to um, really re refer back to where Ken Ham has been going all day long. And it really comes back to what is the source of truth. And, and the, source, the source of truth is in divine revelation. Either you're the source of the truth and everybody has their own truth or there is a truth outside of you that has to be discovered or revealed. And God has given to us his truth. He has revealed his truth. And I want to make an emphasis here. God has revealed his, 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 his truth in his word, but he has revealed his truth also in his son because Jesus is the word. And I want to say a, a word to you as a Christian young person, particularly of an experience with my own children. I have four children. My oldest is 39. My youngest is almost 25. Years ago, my oldest daughter, who is a teacher at a, a school in Israel, uh, was going to work on her master's degree. And when she went to Israel, I said, sweetheart, Israel is a very slippery place for a Christian because you have Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And it would be easy just to acknowledge the fact that there's one God and it's all the same God. And, you know, it's all, and there's not really one specific truth. I said, so when you go to Israel, there's two things you're going to have to settle in your mind. And these are two things every young person has to settle. Every student at Bob Jones University has to settle. And I believe that it, I don't believe this is different than what Ken Ham has been saying. I actually believe that it goes together. And that is, you have to determine, did God, become a human, did God become a human being in the person of Jesus Christ? Is Jesus God incarnate? Did the God of glory and creation become a man? Because when you read the Bible, beginning in Genesis, and you read about the fall of man, God also in the beginning of Genesis said, there would one come that would be the, come from the seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent. Who was, who was later called the second Adam. And all of the Old Testament is a picture or a prophecy or an example pointing forward to the coming of Christ. And Christ is the revelation of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so the question is this, was Jesus Christ God incarnate? Did God come to this earth 2,000 years ago? And the reason I say that is because everything that Ken Ham has been saying today was validated by Jesus when he was asked questions. So he's asked a question about divorce, the right and wrong of divorce, and what did he do? He says, well, you have a bill of divorcement, but that's not the way it was in the beginning, and what does he do? He goes back to creation. And what Jesus did is he pointed to us and showed us how to deal with the issues of the world, and the issues of the world are found in divine design when you go back to Genesis 1 and 11. So it's not a, it's not a disconnect from Jesus, it's all a connection. So did Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ God, number one, and number two, did he rise from the dead? That is, did he actually conquer the grave and come out of the grave alive? And is he alive today? Is he seated at the right hand of the Father? Did he ascend into heaven? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. And when you, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So it is a connection with the whole scripture, Genesis to Revelation, is not 66 separate books. It's one book in these 66 parts that is the revelation of God to us. And so I just want to emphasize that for all of you young people, because you have to settle in your heart. Did Jesus come to this earth as a human being and he was God? Did God become a man? Did he rise from the dead? When I settled that at 19 years old, when I got saved, everything in the Bible made sense to me then. Creation, the flood, the fall of man. I, I've never sat around and wondered, you know, like, uh, like the video you showed. I never, I thought that was absolutely crazy. Because if you believed in Jesus, how can you actually believe that? And so you, you got to stay focused on the main thing. Yeah. Um, when I get back uh, to Northern Kentucky, uh, tomorrow, I'm actually uh, speaking at the Bible Bee, if you've heard of the Bible Bee, uh, where they have these competitions of uh, 
all these young people reciting scripture and so on. And they wanted me to, to give them something encouraging, just to encourage them in, in learning God's word. And so what I did was um, I went through and obtained lots and lots of scriptures. In fact, we got about 150 of them. Uh, so I'm going to go through those very quickly because I've highlighted the bits I want them to see. You know the number of times you will read, it is written, as it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Have you not read, as the prophet said, as the scripture uh, states, as it's said in the scriptures. And you go through the Bible and you realize, wow, how important it is that we know the scriptures because that's the foundation for all of our thinking and the source of, of truth, as you say. And so if we do that in relation to this particular question, uh, let me look at another angle as well. And that is that when you read the scriptures, it says you're either for Christ or against. It says you either gather or scatter. You either walk in light or walk in darkness. You build your house on the rock or you build your house on the sand. There's the broad way, there's the narrow way. And one of the things you realize, and actually I put this in the book Divided Nation, uh, for those of you who are getting that, uh, and that is, there is no neutral position. And I think there's been a great failure of a lot of the, uh, of, of a lot of our churches actually, and, and homes, and a great failure to teach and raise up generations like you people here to understand there is no neutral position. Um, so let me see, let me share with you how that practically plays out. So the Freedom From Religion Foundation come in and they say, you can't have the Bible in public schools, you can't have prayer or nativity scenes, you can't have these crosses, nativity scenes in public places because you're imposing your Christian beliefs, it needs to be neutral. And so you need to take those away and now make it neutral. But wait a minute, if you start from God's word, there's no neutral position. So if it's not for Christ, it is what? Against, you know what that means? Secular is not neutral. We've got to understand that. So when people say, oh, public school is neutral, we don't have God, the Bible, now it's neutral. And many parents have been lulled into thinking, I think many Christians lulled into thinking, oh, it's neutral. It's not neutral. If it's not for Christ, it's against. So if the Bible is not the foundation for the worldview taught in our public schools, what is the foundation? Man's word. So what is the religion? Naturalism, that you explain everything by natural processes. What is naturalism? Naturalism is atheism. That's what it is. And so when you start to understand things correctly based on, on the scriptures, then you start to realize, wait a minute, what the Freedom From Religion Foundation is doing is imposing their religion of atheism on the culture and on the public schools. Because that's another aspect. People have this idea and you'll hear the atheists say this all the time. You go to church, you have a Bible, you're religious. We don't go to church, we're not religious. But actually, if you look up the definition of religion in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it has a number of different categories. But one of them is a system of principle uh, held to by ardor and faith. That's atheism. And you see, when, when an atheist says to you, we're not religious, we don't have a religion, you people have a religion, you need to, you need to come right back at them, gently, nicely, and say to them, that's not true. You have a worldview. Your worldview is naturalism. Your worldview says you can explain everything without God. You don't believe in God. That is the, your religion. See, think about it in terms of everybody has a worldview. Everybody. And your worldview either starts from God's word or man's word. Their word is not, worldview is not from God's word. So that's their religion. You know, when I talked about the battle between God's word and man's word, it's really a battle between two religions. That's what it is different belief systems because of different foundations. Once you understand that, it's a key to really knowing how to talk to those people and not be intimidated by them. A lot of times we're intimidated, be, you know, that's why you need to have answers too, you need to learn to be equipped. But a lot of times we're intimidated because we think, oh, well, I have a religion, I'm biased. They're not biased. No, that's just simply not true. And so make sure we study the scriptures to know how to think correctly about those issues. So, so I want to build on this just a little bit of what, what you're saying, Dr. Ham, about when somebody says they really don't have a religion or they don't have a worldview and how you go about interacting with them. And then what you said earlier, Dr. Pettit, about enthusiasm that exists in this generation and a fervency for uh, walking with the Lord and serving Him. 
What, what principles or what advice do you have for these young people about what they need to be doing to prepare in order to stand for God, to stand for His Word in the midst of the kind of culture that we live in? I would, I would say this. You know, you have to, you know the scripture says, study to show yourself approved as a workman unto God, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. You, we need to make sure we study. You, if you're going to stand for the Lord, you have to know your scriptures. You have to be equipped with answers. You've got to do some study. Now, let me say this to you. Here's what, what I found. This, this is subjective, but just my own personal experience of 45 years traveling around the world. I think that 95%, probably 98 maybe 99.9, but 90-something percent of people who oppose you as a Christian, the majority of them have no idea why they believe what they do. They just regurgitate what they've been told. They regurgitate what they were taught at school. They regurgitate what they heard by the media. I've just found the majority of them. That's the way it is. You get yourself equipped with answers. You know what you believe. You know why you believe, what you do, where it comes from. You're ready for the Genesis 3 attack questions of today. Uh, that's why we publish those books that we do and the website that we have and so on. You get yourself equipped with answers. You'll run, you run rings around those people. I mean, you really will. And, and then the other thing I would say is uh, to, to look at it like this. My, my analogy for the way in which we need to act as Christians in, in dealing with people is... Um, and bringing apologetics and the Bible together uh, as we do at Answers in Genesis would be this. When, when Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, he said, move the stone. Now, do you agree that Jesus didn't have to tell people to move the stone? He could have moved the stone like that, right? One thought, word. But no, what you can do, you do. You move the stone. But what could not men do? Raise Lazarus from the dead. Only God's Word can do that. Only the resurrection and life can do that. And so, I look at our ministry as this. You know, my, my late brother, he was a great Bible teaching pastor in Australia. And um, he would say, you know, I'm going out to uh, minister to dead people. Because if you're a non-Christian, you're a dead person. The Bible says you're dead in trespasses and sin. And he realized we can't raise the dead. It's God's word that raises the dead. God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so, when you're thinking about raising the dead, you think about Jesus raising Lazarus, move the stone. I look on it that what we need to do is use every argument we can, provided we're equipped, provided we've done our study, um, and maybe go to a place like Bob Jones University so you get equipped too uh, with all the answers, uh, but be equipped so that you can then answer those questions. You're moving the stone away, moving the stumbling block away. Well, how do you know there's a God? Well, isn't the Bible just a book of mythology? Well, what about science in the Bible? Well, how do you know Jesus is God? You know, I'm not just talking about creation apologetics, I'm talking about general Bible apologetics. Because, you know, what if someone asks you, where'd the Bible come from? Why should we trust it? Aren't there Bibles that have different books in them? Why do they have these different books? Which, which is right? Uh, you, you need to know how to answer all those questions. So you need to do some study. And you're giving those answers, that's rolling the stone away, but never divorce that from pointing them to the Word of God and the Gospel that saves, because that's the whole point. And then, when you've done your best, because I've had people come to me and say, I feel like I'm a failure, I've been trying to witness to my uncle for years, and I don't get anywhere with him, and so on. If you've done your best, and you've studied, and you're equipped, and you do your best to answer their questions and point them to the Word of God, remember something. God's the one that does the saving, not us. But you need to be faithful in doing what God has called us to do. Our responsibility to preach. Uh, how shall they call on him and whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are said, preach the word, give answers for what you believe, do what the scripture says, point them to the word and understand it's God's word that saves. And you know, to me, that's always um, reassuring to know as long as I've done my best, and I have done my study, uh, to do that, and I've done my best in answering those questions, and I point them to the Word and to the saving gospel, which is exactly what we see at the Ark. If you come to the Ark and the Creation Museum, we answer lots of questions, 
and we're talking about God's Word and we point people to the Savior. That's the whole point. That's what it's all about. So as long as, as you do that, you never know how God will use that in that person's heart. It might be years later. It might be on the spot right then. Uh, and I, I, I've met some of the students who used to be in my class in secular public school in Australia. And to me, they were just secular young people. And I would teach them about uh, the Bible and you know, Genesis and so on and, and give arguments against evolution and millions of years that were in their textbooks. I did that as a science teacher. I met some of those students years later who said, you know what, God used all that you said uh, to convict me and I became a Christian many years later. You just Amen. never know uh, the foundation you're laying in a person's life. So I'm gonna share an experience that I had the first time I went to the Creation Museum, never been there before and I think we were, a tra it was back when I was traveling as an evangelist and we took our group there we were walking around and looking at things. And I turned the corner and there was a glass case, as I recall, and there was a copy, I think it was your dad's Bible, was it your dad's Bible? And I stood there and I looked at it and did, did you have, had you made an ark when you were a child? Did you? Uh, he made that He made me. the ark, he made the ark, okay. As I stood there and and I'm old enough to have lived long enough to be able to look back and, and, and watch things happen. And as I saw that Bible there, I, I thought, and I, and I smiled and I thought, that's why Ken Ham's doing what he's doing today. It's really not rocket science. At some point in his life as a young man, he had a godly parents, godly father, where do you think the ark came from? I, I mean, I know where it came from in the Bible, but where do you think the one in Kentucky came from? Why was that in his mind? And what happened was he was influenced as a young person towards the authority of Scripture to believe the Bible, God's Word, and that the life is built on one brick at a time, little by little, grace on grace, glory on glory, and you, you, you do today what you know to do, and then tomorrow it's the next day, and tomorrow it's the next day, and tomorrow it's the next day, and God gives you vision and faith. You learn that without faith it's impossible to please God, and you respond in obedient faith all along the way, and God does His work through His faithful servant. I'm saying that to you, and I think Dr. Ham is a wonderful example of that, but I'm saying that to all of you. All of you here have a Bible. If you know Jesus is your Savior, you have faith. So now learn and grow and, and let each day have its own, you take steps of faith and you trust God and you believe God. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get the faith to do something tomorrow that you don't have today. You build on that. And young person, this is just the way that it works. And it's amazing what many of you will be able to do if you'll take that one step at a time, day by day, believing the word as he has said, and responding to that, growing in the grace of the Lord, and taking steps of faith, trusting God. You need to trust God to do great things in your life today. Great things today, not great things 20 years from now. What is, what is the great thing God wants to do in your life today? Then do that. By faith, believe Him, and let God build on top of that. So as believers, we're called to walk by faith day by day, today. That's what it means to walk by faith. It's, it's this day, and we're also a hopeful people. But I even think as we see this right behind where you all are sitting, where I'm standing, cultures in chaos, it's really easy to get focused on this. So, when we look at the culture around us and we're called to be hopeful, we'd love to hear you all talk about where is God in all of this? How do we present the hope of the gospel to people who are living in this kind of a culture? Where is God in the midst of all of this? Well, I'll be real brief and let Dr. Ham finish up on this one. Uh, God is here. Number one, we have His Word. We have the Bible, amen? We have the Bible. Number two, we have the church. 
the, the body of believers. We have believers that are here. Uh, we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer. And we know that God, and we have, we have the divine providence of God at work because whatever God is doing today, God planned to do it in eternity past. So we have an eternal God who is at work in this very present. So we have all the more reason to be the most hope-filled, excited people when we understand the Church of God, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the providence of God. And this is a great day to be alive. Uh, I'm, willing, I'm ready to go to heaven when the Lord wants me to go to heaven, but I, I don't want to miss today. I want to find out, God, what are you doing today? And this is a great time to be alive. You know, I've um, often thought about when you, when you see what's happening in our culture and what many of our politicians are doing, I mean, I think if we were God, there'd be lightning strikes and charred bodies everywhere in Washington, D.C. Um, but you know what? Uh, I, one, of my, one of my good friends has, has often said this, God is yet to make his first mistake because God doesn't make mistakes. Amen. And he is the sovereign God. And you know, in the scripture, we look at what's happening from a human perspective and we say, this is so bad, this is so evil. God, why are you allowing this? Uh, and it's easy for us to look at it from that human perspective. And yet, when you read the scriptures, again, you need to know the scriptures, you know, what does God say? He looks down on them, he sees all that, he holds them in derision. They think they're getting away with this. They, they think they have a free hand to do whatever the, they want to do. They're only doing what God is allowing them to do. And God has his purposes. Um, I, I think of the book of Job, you know, and people say, wait a minute, isn't Job all about suffering and death and why, why is there suffering and death? And yet it doesn't answer the question. Well, it does. Because at the end of the book of Job, um, and, and, and God has heard all that Job and his friends were talking about and so on, and then God said, Job, I want you to listen to this. I want to tell you who I am. Were you there when I made the foundations of the earth? Do you know how to hold these stars together? Do you know how to do this? Do you know this? Do you know that? Do you, know you know what happens as you read through there? You realize Job recognizes something because he repents in dust and ashes. And he realizes, wait a minute, you're God. How, who am I to question God? And that is the answer. The answer is let God be God. And in the context of what's happening today, I sort of, uh, I hope it's not like, you know, I don't know how to pronounce it. Do you, what do you say in America? Is it Habakkuk? Or Hab Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Okay, so I know with Australian accent, well, I'm sure we say it differently. Um, anyway, Habakkuk, uh, his complaint. Oh Lord, how long will I cry for help and you will not hear and cry to you for violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention. Look what's happening. Look at all this evil that's going on. You know what God's answer was? You think that's bad? <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> you will to see what I do when I build, bring the Chaldeans in there to, uh, to come against these people because of their evil. You see, God has purposes to judge because of rebellion. But then, you know what? Those that came and did that, <coughs> they had to answer to God for doing that, and they were judged. And I think of, you know, you mentioned um, Romans 1. I think we're seeing Romans 1 play out in our culture. What happens when a culture rebels against God? You think about the abortion issue. 60 million children murdered in their mother's womb since Roe versus Wade. Compare that to the Holocaust in Germany, I mean, it pales in comparison when you think of the number of people involved. Is God going to stand back and just let that happen? He's going to hold uh, people accountable. And as you look what happens when people worship the creator, uh, worship the creature rather than the creator, which is really what the whole evolutionary belief system is all about. When you look at that permeating our culture, when you look at the utter rebellion and the child sacrifice, because that's what abortion really is, is child sacrifice to the God of self. And you look at all of that, and then what does God say? He turns people over to their depraved natures. It's, I believe he withdraws the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit and turns them over to their depraved nature. And then as you read through Romans 1, you see the sexual revolution. Then the next step is the homosexual revolution. And now you're seeing the gender revolution. 
as a culture is turned over <coughs> to people's depravity, it's part of, it's, it's God judging the culture. But he will use that to, as Dr. Pettit said, raise up people like yourselves to stand in this culture and to be a witness in this culture. And who knows, maybe bring revival again, new reformation in our churches and revival uh, again. And maybe God is, is calling you all to do that and preparing you uh, for that. Uh, because those people that are you know, involved in all of this you know, legislation about LGBT and abortion and so on, they will give account to God. Yeah. It's going to happen. But vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So we just need to be faithful and do what God's called us to do. And one last thing I'll say there is, you know, the, the, the king that entrusted resources to his servants, and Jesus, Jesus told this, and then he went away and he said, do business until I return. And we know that that's a parable talking about Jesus entrusting gifts, talents to us, whether it's material resources, or he's given us a gift of music, or a gift of teaching, or a gift of preaching, or whatever it is. But regardless of what's happening in the culture, we are to do the business of the king until he returns. Amen. So don't get depressed by what's going on out there. Let's just get out there and do the business of the king. And, you know, God promises he will not, uh, his word will not return unto him void. And so proclaim the truth of God's word. Amen. You join me in thanking Dr. Ham and Dr. Pettit for the time with us. And we thank you for joining us for this session. At this time, we'll have Dr. Weathers come, and I think he has a couple of announcements for us. Thank you, Dr. Weir, for moderating, and thank you both again for those valuable answers for us. A, a few announcements, some by way of reminder. So this is the session that as you exit the doors, get a free book, one book per family unit. So I hope you enjoy that and read it and learn from it. So that's after this session, grabbing that book. And then immediately following the session, grabbing your book and taking a few minutes to stretch your legs, there'll be three different sessions at 2 p.m. So in about 15 minutes at 2 p.m., three different sessions. Students, you will be in this room Homeschool educators will be in Levinson Hall. Levinson Hall is a meeting room by our Welcome Center, which is out these doors, down the sidewalk and to the right, near our Welcome Center area in the Student Center. It's Levinson Hall, and that's for homeschool educators. And then for teachers and administrators, you will be in a meeting room in the back of the den. If you say, what in the world is the den? It is formerly the snack shop. So if that uh, name rings a bell, it's then the snack shop, which is the eating area across from Levinson Hall. So both uh, homeschool parents, teachers, and administrators will be in uh, that section of campus if you exit this building and turn to the right down the sidewalk to the student center area. Levinson Hall will be near the Welcome Center, and then the den is kind of like the coffee, Chick-fil-A, uh, Papa John's area, and then there's a meeting room that's in the back area of the den across from, uh, there's a fireplace there, and you'll be able to find that meeting room there. And again, that session will be at 2 p.m. And then at 3.15, so after the 2 p.m. session, there'll be a session at 3.15 for anyone interested called The Bruins Way and What's Bruin. That will be at 3.15 p.m. in Levinson Hall. So that's for students, for anyone to find out more information about Bob Jones University. There'll be games, prizes, and t-shirts at What's Bruin at 315 in Levinson Hall. And then there'll be many resources for sale, as Dr. Ham mentioned, in the Road to Haver lobby, which is out this way. And those resources will be for sale until 3.30 p.m. this afternoon. So we encourage you to go by and get some of those resources to continue equipping yourself to stand in a culture of chaos. Again, thank you for your attention. Uh, we'll be dismissed with a word of prayer, and then you'll be able to grab your book, and then young people back here for a session at 2 p.m., and then homeschool parents, educators, and administrators meeting over in the student center area, either in Levinson Hall or in the back of the den. So go ahead and close in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed from this session. Father, thank you for your kindness and for your goodness. Thank you for the truth of your word that you have given us to stand on. We pray that you would help us to learn it, and to grow from it, that we will be equipped to love you and to love others in a culture of chaos, that we may shine as lights in a dark world, proclaiming the grace and truth that your Son offers. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you. We'll see you at 2 p.m. Teens in here and educators and administrators across the way.